Um, first of all, let me uh, explain just a little bit of um, what we were going to talk about uh, in today's webinar. Uh, it's the first anniversary of the Karabakh War, uh, which has been started one year ago uh, since the war in Nagorno-Karabakh start, started. In 27th of September 2020, uh, the Armenian armed uh, army like, launched an attack on civilians as well as um, Azerbaijani forces, and uh, isolated, like violated several several humanitarian ceasefire agreements, which uh, created intense uh, conflict uh, and resulted 44 days of war. During this conflict, uh, which ended uh, under November 10 deal, Azerbaijan liberated several cities, including villages and nearly 300 settlements uh, from Armenian occupation. And of course, uh, the use of armed drones by Azerbaijan, including several modern military equipment uh, as well, has enabled Azerbaijan to reach a diverse victory in, in Karabakh. And of course, the conflict has largely ended by the Armenian, like in the Armenian occupation uh, of some Azerbaijan territories. Uh, however, the situation in the in Karabakh is on the ground is still intense and fragile. So uh, Minsk group, um, unfortunately, was not getting in as it should be uh, in this uh, conflict. Russia had the uh, like um, the vacuum, political vacuum in the area. So in this webinar, we will be discussing about uh, the like prospect, prospects for the renewed fighting. If there will be a third uh, like a Karabakh war, uh, what we learned from this one year, and uh, will Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the local participants uh, respect the ceasefire agreement and accept this uh, sustained presence of the Russian peacekeepers in the conflict uh, zone. So we'll be discussing the first anniversary, as I mentioned in the beginning, but let me start uh, introducing the speakers. Um, the first speaker is going to be the Ambassador Ellen uh, Suleymanov, who is the Azerbaijan Ambassador to United Kingdom. Previously, he was Ambassador to other, uh, of Azerbaijan to United States. Um, thanks uh, to him to, for, for joining us. Uh, second one is going to be uh, Professor Taras Cusillo, is uh, the professor at the Department of Political Science, National University of Kiev, uh, Mohalia Academy, and a non resident fellow uh, in the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Um, third one, I will be uh, he will be joining us uh, from Doha, I believe. Uh, he's Dr. Ali Bekish. He is the research assistant professor at the Ibn uh, Khaldun Center for Humanitarian and Social Science at the Qatar University. Thanks to him as well. And the uh, fourth one, last one but not least, is a Turanga Farnley, who is based in Turkey. He is the TRE world researcher, he will be joining us to discuss the issues uh, and um, discuss the one year of war today. And also before I start uh, asking questions, I would like to thanks to the Circle Foundation, which is an independent non-participant think tank based on, in London, dedicated to uh, innovative studies on national uh, um, and also like concerning about Turkey and United Kingdom, Turkey uh, relations. So before um, I ask my question, let me uh, ask everyone a simple, um, uh, simply uh, what you think, what is your analysis for, for during this one year um, of the Karabakh war? I would like to start with the ambassador, please. Thank you, uh, and good evening, Saeed Hanu. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I also want to thank, offer my special thank you to the Circle Foundation uh, for holding this discussion. I think that's a very timely one, and it's a very appropriate timing uh, to do this. I also, uh, of course, it's great to welcome uh, my friends and colleagues uh, who will be on the panel today with us. And I, I don't want to really have a monologue. I would much prefer for us, of course, have a discussion and I look forward to your questions. 
However, uh, today, of course, we speak uh, on the first anniversary of the beginning of the Second Karabakh War, uh, when uh, on September 27th, as a result of the Armenian attack uh, against civilians and military forces in Azerbaijan, it was not the first attack, of course, we all remember the events of July of 2020 and then August of 2020 and a different provocation. Uh, prior to that, there were, it all came, unfortunately, to the resumption of hostilities. And uh, the Azerbaijani response to all these attacks, including the ones on the, especially on September 27th, led to a um, resumption of hostilities. And as a result, Azerbaijan has restored international law and uh, liberated its territories. If anyone who watched the march yesterday saw the president and the first lady of Azerbaijan walking, leading the parade at the march with uh, more than some almost 3,000 people, carrying the photos of people who were killed and who became martyrs during this war. This is a very emotional term. Uh, term of Azerbaijan for the last three decades, we have lived with occupation and displacement. I used to be UNHCR officer, uh, High Commission for Refugees officer in Azerbaijan, and I saw myself on uh, the results of the displacement. There is no way, there are no words to describe the feeling of overcoming uh, this major challenge to Azerbaijan's statehood, Azerbaijan's independence, Azerbaijan's territorial integrity and Azerbaijan's very existence. I have a very, it's difficult to speak very positively today, of course, because I mean, it's still uh, the anniversary of the war. It's the anniversary of the loss of people. Yesterday we had an uh, event marking the memory, uh, honoring the memory of those wars. But the feeling generally, I think should be very positive. Tell you why. Uh, since the, since the signing of the Tarawatar Agreement on November 10th, there has been some skirmishes, but no major resumption of violence. Overall, the situation is rather clear. Azerbaijan has indicated and shown that it's, it's, it's working towards peace. Uh, the president of Azerbaijan, President Amali, today and yesterday, he has indicated in a number, number of extended interviews the position of Azerbaijan, our readiness for peace, we offer cooperation, peace, and integration to Armenia and the entire region. Uh, one thing which also happened, of course, is that Azerbaijan has been able to mobilize its economic and human resources. And you could see very simple facts, the, the way the Shusha is being restored, the, the very cultural capital of Azerbaijan, the way the roads are being built on a daily basis, the the, result, the beginning of activity in the Fizuli airport. And it's, it's not even one year since the end of the war. It's one year since the beginning of the war and the planes already take off and land in, in Fizuli. So think about the effort put in it. I mean, I'm not even talking about other things where we all uh, face uh, logistical uh, difficulties and bureaucratic uh, challenges in the most developed Western countries imagine in Azerbaijan overcoming this outcome of the world. Everything is destroyed. And you see the level of destruction. I mean, there's literally nothing. And to be able to mobilize resources and to build on this, I think it's a major achievement. We could talk more about this and we will talk more about this. One thing I want to say uh, we will never ever forget everybody who stood with us and who supported us during that war. And I think. You know that's an important time of uh, time of challenge, and in a time of challenge, whoever stands by you, you remember that for a long time. And I think the special role in this is, of course, uh, belongs to Turkey. Turkey has shown to us that the Turkish people and the, and the Turkish Republic is not just a neighbor, is not just a friend or you know partner, or it's it's we're members of the same family. And I think the way. Uh, the Turkish state, the Turkish leadership, and the Turkish people have proven themselves to be the closest and the most reliable friends and 
the other senses to serve Azerbaijan is unforgettable and of course are all deeply grateful to our Turkish brothers and sisters. Uh, also important is of course that as we speak about the war and about the consequences, we should not forget that this is deep human tragedy for thousands and thousands of people who lost their lives in, in defense of their motherland, in defense of Azerbaijan and in restoring what had to be done uh, for the last 30 years. And I, uh, I look forward once again to discussion, uh, but I, as you understand, for most of us, it's a very emotional time and a very emotional day, yesterday and today. And I think the rest of those days where we commemorate and remember the last year's war, uh, it will be an emotional roller coaster. I think with a, with a, with a feeling of loss of friends and people who were lost, and at the same time feeling overwhelmed by joy on uh, resolving the challenge which faced Azerbaijan for the last three decades, pretty much since the beginning of our independence. Thank you very much, and I will go to the discussion. Thanks, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your opinion. Uh, let's go to uh, Professor uh, Kuzio, please. Uh, what's the um, you have a strong uh, like article I've read today. Uh, what do you think about this one year? Well, I, I think that there are four reasons, four main reasons. I mean, there are probably others, but that you could put forward as to explain why Azerbaijan won this war. Um, I think the first one is, is patience. Patience is a virtue. Um, I say this not being a very patient person myself. Um, and um, Azerbaijan waited until it had built up its economy, energy infrastructure as a major energy, energy exporter, and of course, its military. It built that up so it was ready. Um, other countries in the region did not do that, and they suffered the consequences from conflict and losing conflict. So I think that um, that is very important because, of course, the Azerbaijan of today is not the Azerbaijan of the 1990s. Secondly, um, as has been already said by the ambassador, Turkish support was crucial. Um, and Sir, not only... we, can't, we can't see you. Can you open your uh, camera, please? Camera, please, yes. Uh, how do I do that? Um, how do I... Really? It's not... You can't see me? You can't see me? No, we can't still see you. Uh, yes. Can you see me now? No, we can't still see you. No. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Can yeah. we? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, maybe it was. Okay. The... Um, the second thing is, um, um, as was already been mentioned by the ambassador, Turkish support. But I would stress it's not just diplomatic, it's also, and it's not just military equipment. Um, for, for many, many years, I don't know exactly how many. Uh, Turkey was training Azerbaijani officers to NATO standards. This is very important because what the war was, the war was a 21st century war fought by Azerbaijan against the 20th century Soviet or Russian army, which was Ar Armenian. Um, and, and that was clearly, clearly uh, the case. I think we should also, as I say in my article, I think we should also point out that President Erdogan took one step further along the road than earlier other previous Turkish presidents. I mean, it's one thing to say you support Azerbaijan, and it's another thing to go even further. And I think he did take that extra mile, shall we say. My third point is that, um, and I've used maybe some British humor here, that maybe the, Azer maybe the Armenian intelligence services were on vacation for 10 years or 15 years, um, because, where, how did they miss the rise of this new energy, economic and military power, Azerbaijan? They still seem to have this image or this vision of Azerbaijan as the country of the 1990s, and not, the, not this new, new country. Um, I'm joking, of course, I don't think they were on vacation, but I think it's more a question of arrogance, arrogance and complacency. Um, and here um, I've written articles comparing how Russians look down on Ukrainians and how Armenians look down on Azerbaijanis. 
And this arrogance underestimates your enemy, your, your, your competitor, shall we say. And, and the Russians did this with Ukraine in 2014. And I think Armenia has done this with, um, with Azerbaijan. They just expected Azerbaijan to be always like it was in the 1990s. Um, let's also remember that um, 15 countries emerged from the Soviet Union, but and each one of those has potential territorial claims against their neighbors. Azerbaijan has, there are three times more Azerbaijan is living in Iran than in Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan does not do territorial claims. But two countries in the former Soviet Union, Russia and Armenia, are irredentist countries. They have territorial claims because they support Greater Russia or Greater Armenia. And that, that impacts upon this, um, this, uh, this conflict. Final, final point of the four points is that we should never underestimate good timing. Um, in 2018, there was a revolution in Armenia and Russia hates these kinds of so-called color revolutions. So the Russian leadership was always a bit untrustworthy towards Nikol Pashinyan. And that is important, why? Because nobody knew during this conflict, I'm sure nobody, whether Russia would or would not intervene on Armenia's side. Armenia was always pushing for Russia to intervene and, and to protect it, protect its territorial gains. Russia used the claim that these territories are in Azerbaijan, we'll only defend you if the war goes into Armenia. But I think the real reason was uh, the Russian leadership do not like Nikol Pashinyan because he's like, um, say, Yushchenko or, or Saakashvili in Georgia. My final point is, and I think this will go into the discussion, is if we look ahead, um, Turkey and Russia have completely incompatible interests in this conflict. Um, there are four more years left of the Russian peacekeeping mandate. And this uh, lack of similarity in, in interest between Turkey and, and Russia will become more and more apparent as we approach 2025 when the mandate ends out. Why are they incompatible? Russia has no interest in resolving this conflict. Russia has never resolved a single conflict in Eurasia where its so-called peacekeepers have gone. Never, not a single one. Russia doesn't want to resolve conflicts. It wants to stay there forever. Um, that's Russia's aim, aim, goal. If it resolves the conflict, there's no longer any need for Russian peacekeepers. Turkey on, has the same viewpoint as Azerbaijan, that it wants the conflict to be finally resolved with a uh, peace treaty, with um, the reopening of borders, et cetera, et cetera. So these two interests are very different. And, and therefore, although at the moment, the relations between Turkey and Russia are cordial, um, I think on the question of Karabakh, they will diverge fundamentally as we approach 2025. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's pass to Dr. Ali Baker, please. Thank you very much for inviting me and for being uh, with you with uh, such uh, distinguished guests. I'm very really privileged to talk today. I will keep my uh, comment uh, short. Uh, I will leave it to the conversation later. But uh, let me start by saying that uh, I think that the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, cause uh, was one of the very few uh, just uh, causes in the world that uh, have been overlooked uh, for a long period of time by the international community and also the powerful states. And uh, uh, despite the fact that there were uh, forced UN Security Council resolutions and uh, two General Assembly resolutions that uh, uh, actually demands uh, Armenia to end its occupation and uh, withdraw uh, its forces from the region. But uh, Yerevan maintained uh, its occupation for at least uh, 30 years. And uh, of course, uh, there were uh, reasons why, why uh, Armenia managed to do this. I think that uh, there were at least 
uh, three uh, main factors. One is the balance of power. And the balance of power, especially in the first two decades, was always tilting towards uh, Armenia. And this was a disadvantage when it comes to Azerbaijan uh, vis a vis Armenia regarding the occupied territories, which was like 20% of Azerbaijan's land. And uh, the second uh, factor, which was the uh, the configuration of the regional and international alliances, uh, which played uh, into Armenians' hands, uh, meaning that uh, many regional, uh, powerful regional and international players uh, supported uh, the Armenian occupation uh, for different uh, reasons, such as uh, Russia and Iran, uh, France and the United States and others. And um, the third reason, in my opinion, the third reason, in my opinion, is that uh, the ineffectiveness of the Minsk group. Uh, this group was supposed to contribute to a peaceful resolution of the conflict, but uh, for decades it didn't because uh, simply it was a biased uh, platform. Now, uh, Azerbaijan uh, suggested at certain point or offered to modify the configuration of this platform and uh, uh, called on to invite uh, Germany and Turkey to create a balance inside the platform and make it uh, effective to uh, reach a peaceful uh, resolution of the conflict. But uh, unfortunately, um, this offer was rejected. So I think that uh, the uh, 44 uh, days war changed uh, all of this and the Armenian occupation was uh, swiftly defeated for the first time. Uh, now, uh, like many uh, or any uh, liberation war, uh, the will of the soldiers uh, is the most important weapon uh, in the field. Uh, uh, there is no doubt that uh, besides, of course, what the, the Mr. Ambassador said and the professor also noted, uh, besides other factors, I think that uh, the will of the Azerbaijani soldiers, the uh, uh, Superior, the moral superiority they enjoyed and also uh, the just cause they fought for um, pushed them to win this war. But uh, also this time, I think that Azerbaijan uh, had uh, a little technological booster, if I uh, may say. Uh, this booster was uh, cheap, uh, very effective and highly lethal. It is called the uh, TB2 drone. Uh, this Turkey made TB2 drone uh, decisively changed the balance of power and effectively uh, uh, helped Azerbaijan to win this uh, war. Now, uh, many experts uh, are calling uh, this war the uh, first uh, war in the history to be won actually mainly by unmanned systems, uh, pointing out to the effectiveness of the uh, TB2 drones. Uh, according to the uh, latest statistics, uh, the very few uh, Azerbaijan acquired uh, Turkey made TB2 drones destroyed around 550 uh, Armenian ground uh, targets, including uh, tanks, artilleries, uh, armored vehicles, uh, SAM systems, air defense systems, radars, uh, different type of vehicles, a group of soldiers, you name it. Uh, yani briefly, this uh, uh, number of very few acquired TBT drones wiped most of the uh, uh, Armenian uh, occupation army in that region. Now, um, of course, uh, this new utility uh, in the battlefield shocked the Armenian army, Armenian soldiers, and even the officials to the extent that uh, they started to promote uh, fake news and disinformation, uh, claiming that other nations, other soldiers, other fighters are fighting on behalf of Azerbaijan. This is not an Azerbaijani soldier fighting the Armenian one. And uh, uh, of course, uh, this was proved uh, wrong. But I think that uh, now this war is being studied carefully and examined uh, in uh, many states around the world uh, to draw the light, uh, right lessons and how uh, technology also can help just cause to win such war. Now, uh, I think that the current, when it comes to the current situation, despite this win, the uh, situation is uh, fragile. Uh, it needs the, uh, all parties to cooperate to build on uh, 
uh, initiatives that support uh, stability, uh, prosperity, and economic integration. Now, Turkey and Azerbaijan took the lead in that part, and they started to work on it. And uh, Azerbaijan also invited other countries like Pakistan to uh, contribute to the construction of the uh, previously occupied and uh, currently liberated region. They also uh, initiated initiatives uh, to the regional economic integrations and opening uh, railways, roads, etc. So I think that Armenians, uh, of course, such, such an equation depends on both sides' intentions. Now, um, Armenians, if they chose uh, the wrong option, then uh, we might go to the wrong path again. But I think that the shock that they uh, uh, had, uh, it will take uh, a little time more uh, to be consumed before they think of uh, maybe uh, starting another war. I will stop here and uh, we'll take it to the questions, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Ali Baker. Uh, let's pass to um, the TRT World Researcher, uh, Turan Japan. What's uh, your thank, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, I mean, obviously the points were very important in, in case of different aspects from international side, but I would like to also like in a brief opening to touch the social side, the mind side maybe of the, the psychological side of the war, what happened. I mean, I would say the muscle part of the major part of the muscle part of the job is ended last year's October, November, but the main part that we should work on it in the mind started because in the last 30 years, especially the generation that I was born into as well, haven't seen Karabakh at all in their lives. I just heard in the books or like the whatever we're told by the elders. So in that sense, Azerbaijanis, I would say, had that sense of weakness or uh, lost glory in the last 30 years. And uh, what happened in October, November changed that. So that's a major difference in the psychology of any nation. And I would say it's one of the major steps of Azerbaijani nation building in the last hundred years. So uh, it's a huge step forward, I would say. And maybe the first time ever Azerbaijan had this type of confidence uh, to step forward in a military sense. So it's a huge difference in the Solus Caucasus as well. In the post-Soviet region, I would say it's, it's the first maybe the success to uh, make a, this kind of comeback after no matter what he is. So uh, I, I see a lot of times, especially working in the media shows us that uh, the people, uh, especially the West are still using uh, that term Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, especially, especially after the, even the official statement of Azerbaijan saying that there is no more Nagorno-Karabakh. There is no more Nagorno-Karabakh in legal sense either because Azerbaijan has already uh, changed that administrative parts of Azerbaijan. But even the, on the other sense, uh, the major, I would say, conflict resolvers or like peace kind of dealers, they're still wanting to show that there is still Nagorno-Karabakh conflict because there are obviously profiteers from that. So uh, I accept that there are certain issues needs to be solved. There are certain kind of, let's say, uh, in brackets, like the status problem that Russia always tells about, Armenia always tells about. But still, uh, I say it's a major difference in the mind and now it's a duty of mostly, obviously, Azerbaijanis, but in the short future, it should be the duty of Armenians as well to make the mindset change and to make uh, that type of uh, comeback in the minds as well to, to maybe uh, to solve the problems in between us without needing anyone, actually. So I see if I accept Mr. Uh, Professor Kuzio's position in this about Russia, and I say, if we want Russia out, uh, final for all. Uh, it's it depends only the solution in between ourselves in the region. Uh, thank you, Gafarla. Um, let me ask. Um, I listen all of you, but uh, there are a couple of questions that I want to ask uh, all of you. First, I will start with the ambassador Elin Sleimanov. Um, we talk about the um, like use of uh, technology, the balance of power, and. Uh, you know, like Azerbaijan um, had a good uh, strategy for diplomacy. Uh, the Azerbaijan president Aliyev was always informing the, the people of Azerbaijan. Um, we can use soft power. He also used soft power. 
in this modern world. How do you see the, um, I mean, uh, the diplomacy, how diplomacy worked in this war, uh, especially for, for the President Aliyev? Thank you, Saeed Khan, for your question. And I want to uh, thank uh, the panelists for uh, raising a number of very important points. Ali Bey mentioned that it, uh, the Azerbaijani Armenian conf conflict in Azerbaijan and the occupation of Azerbaijani lands was one of the most important and most just uh, causes in the, in the world. And it was overlooked. So it's very much to thank you. And I agree with the patience. Uh, patience with which uh, Azerbaijani leadership uh, rebuilt the country. But, I mean, it's difficult to imagine. Imagine Azerbaijan emerges from the ruins of the Soviet Union, uh, a country which is lands are occupied, people are displaced, uh, economic instability, economic decline, 1980s, early 1990s, and then. Of course, under the leadership of our late uh, national leader, Haider Ali, the nation began rebuilding itself, put up strategic goals, and began fulfilling them. And under the leadership of uh, President Ilham Ali, what happened was that Azerbaijan did indeed become uh, an engine and the most developed uh, economically part of the region. And that's all part of diplomacy. I mean, uh, it, they were coming piece by piece. Azerbaijan leadership uh, in a, Azerbaijan leadership in the non-aligned uh, Azerbaijan's election to the UN Security Council. Those are small pieces. Also, President Ali always led our effort, let's say, in the things which people don't normally fully appreciate it at the time, such as, for instance, winning Olympic medals. But I think it's very important that uh, Azerbaijani flag and Azerbaijani athletes were winning. They were, they were, the, the flag was raised, the, the anthem was played, and the people felt that there was an element of success. And it, Azerbaijan has become a successful country. I mean, Baku, uh, all of this together, of course, supported by the diplomatic effort, uh, produced uh, the desired result. And remember, uh, even during the height of the war, nobody ever questioned that those lands really belong to the Republic of Azerbaijan. International law recognizes uh, the areas which were previously occupied by Armenia, uh, that they were occupied illegally, that they were part of Azerbaijan. And the reason for that is, of course, the, the effort put by the leadership of Azerbaijan in making sure that the, the voice of Azerbaijan is heard, that the case is made. And it's made very clear that President Ali consistently made that case personally, and so did our diplomats following his line. Uh, but the key is, I think, the key for all of this lies in something which uh, Mr. Kuzu repeatedly point, pointed out and keeps pointing out, which is an important thing. And we could talk a lot about this, and that's, I think that is the most important factor. And that is with independence comes responsibility. What it means is that once we became an independent country, it was the wisdom of then uh, our late national leader, uh, Haider Ali, who put together the oil strategy, energy strategy, and began building an independent country which was sovereign and which was responsible and which led the integration in the region because we understood the important uh, thing that everybody in the region should benefit. When they all benefit, we benefit too. And uh, that issue of rebuilding the country, preparing the nation, building new generation, uh, feeling responsibility for the future of the, uh, of the nation is something which made this happen. I mean, President Ali pointed out several times a very important thing. Many of the soldiers who fought and gave their lives were young people. Those are the people who grew up during the independent years of Azerbaijan. They understood and they bore full responsibility for being citizens of an independent country. I think that's a very important fact. And I, I would say something very ironic, which might uh, irritate our Armenian neighbors. But I think what happened last year is also very important for Armenia, because Armenia finally became truly independent. Armenia now can actually be independent from that burden of occupying lands which it cannot sustain, uh, burden of being an illegal occupier of a 
uh, when they were in state. Now they, they can and should focus on developing their own country. And we're, we're ready to help. We want to help them. But they need to understand that, once again, with, this, with independence comes responsibility. There's a difference between a responsible state, a uh, sovereign state, and irresponsible ethnic, uh, ethno nationals. And I think once that distinction is made, what you have is you get uh, joint effort and building a successful uh, region. Also, uh, the last point on diplomacy is that Azerbaijan worked very hard to build relations with every neighbor, with every friend, and gain friends where we couldn't. Uh, and I think it worked in many ways because we acted responsibly, we support our friends, we understood the strategy. And one thing we also learned, we never, we never looked at anybody as a potential adversary. We rather would always look at somebody as a potential partner. Whether those partnerships really work or not, that's a different issue, but uh, we always try to begin from the point of view of partnership. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Kuzu, I, you said in your, um, in your speech saying that you know, Russia has no interest involving in the conflict and they, Russia wants the conflict to be frozen uh, in, the, in the region. But Turkey has a strong support for Azerbaijan, for Azerbaijan uh, citizen. And uh, how do you see the Turkish uh, and uh, Russian relations? Uh, because there are peacekeepers, Russian peacekeepers, and also uh, Turkish peacekeepers in, uh, the, in the region, uh, Karabakh. How do you see the relations uh, of Turkey and Russian relations? And I mean, tomorrow, um, President Erdogan will be go going to the Sochi, to Russia. Uh, probably Karabakh issue is going to be on the table. How do you see the relation, the Turkish-Russian relation affect the region? Well, we, um, we have to take into account 30 years of post-Soviet reality. Um, that's been that's taken place, and um, Russia, um, Russian identity, just like Armenian identity, is far greater than the republic it inherited from the Soviet Union. And Russia sees the entire former Soviet Union, excluding the three Baltic states, as its sphere of influence, as its exclusive sphere of influence. That's why Russia has always been opposed to UN, OSCE or other peacekeepers coming in because it believes that only Russia, so-called CIS, but really Russian peacekeepers should, should uh, undertake this. But of course, Russia has been so-called peacekeeping in inverted commas in Moldova, in Georgia um, for three decades. And it has never had any intention of uh, helping to resolve these conflict, bringing these two parties together. In fact, in uh, Georgia, Russia, uh, recognize the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia in 2008. So um, Russia sees peacekeeping in a different way to say the OSCE or UN. Uh, Russia um, sees it as a kind of permanent forward military base. Mm. And if the conflict is resolved, if there's a peace treaty, if the minority, Armenian minority in Karabakh um, has negotiated some kind of agreement with Baku, um, Armenia accepts the, new, the proper border, um, then there's no need for Russian peacekeepers anymore. Um, they would have to withdraw. So I don't see Russia, based on the last 30 years of experience, I don't see Russia agreeing to that, so supporting that. And you can see this now, with increased frustration from the Azerbaijani political leaders, including the president, and, and the uh, lack of Russia implementing or, or, or pressuring Armenia to implement the November 2020 ceasefire agreement. Um, and also mm -hmm. turning a blind eye to, trans Russia is doing in the, um, with the trans so-called transportation cargo vehicles, doing the same as what he's doing in Eastern Ukraine. These so-called civilian transportation cargoes going to East Ukraine from Russia and going from Armenia to Karabakh through the Cor Lachin Corridor are bringing military supplies, bringing new, new fresh soldiers. Just like in Eastern Ukraine, they're using the same camouflage tactics. 
Um, so mm -hmm. the, um, the what, um, what all of this about Russia sees me to see that with Turkey, there is an in incompatibility because what is Turkish interest? Turkey's interests are of course, especially since the Shusha declaration in June is in finalizing, finishing this conflict. So peace treaty, reopening borders, reopening trade, um, ensuring that there's no more kind of a war any, anymore. So um, Turkey wants closure. Russia does not, is not interested in closure. What this means, I mean, I'm not an advisor to any government, but what this means is that you have four years um, to of course uh, see what Russia will or will not be doing. I may be wrong, I doubt it. Um, but in the meantime, I would in parallel look at alternatives to Russian peacekeepers. So maybe the non-aligned movement maybe UN, maybe US, OSCE, um, but hopefully they would be do a better job because I somehow, on, based on the last year with the weak implementation of the ceasefire agreement, and really it's up to Russia to pressure Armenia to accept the end of the war, except that they were defeated. I don't think Russia is doing that. I don't think I Russia is telling the Armenians, hey, you were defeated. You have to accept, you have to sign a peace treaty. I don't think Russia is doing that. And that's why there's this kind of dragging on. Um, so I, I think um, inevitably there will be um, different paths taken by both country, Turkey and Russia. That's, that's I my... Um, <laughs> um, I can be a bit more forthright than the ambassador, of course. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much okay. for the opinion. <laughs> yeah, thank opinion. you. Um, let me go to uh, uh, to Ali Baker. Um, you know, like in in, in this conflict, uh, like Turkish and Israeli drones have been used during this conflict, um, including Israeli um, Iron Dome as well. So. Um, let me ask how um, the regional countries like um, Iran also uh, played an important role supporting Armenia, sending some military equipments to, uh, to Armenia, including France was uh, been sent uh, in according in, in the media as, as long as I read that uh, France sent PG PKK uh, terrorists uh, to Armenia to fight against Azerbaijan. How do you see this conflict, um, the, the regional countries affected the conflict, like, like Iran, France? Let, let me first uh, uh, correct one uh, information. Uh, as far as I know, Azerbaijan didn't use the Israeli Iron Dome uh, system. Uh, yes, uh, it used uh, some uh, Israeli drones, but not the Iron Dome system. Uh, second, uh, I can talk about the Iranian position. Um, um, yani it is well known that Iran, uh, for a long period of time, supported Armenia at the expense of Azerbaijan and the Armenian uh, occupation. And uh, uh, Iran had the interest in uh, maintaining the statico. Uh, for as long as uh, it serves its interests. Now, uh, why Iran would do so, although uh, many would assume that Iran should actually support uh, Azerbaijani stance against uh, Armenia, uh, I think of at least uh, four main reasons. Uh, first, uh, successful secular uh, Azerbaijan uh, is a threat to Iran because uh, there is at least uh, 25 percent Iranians from Azeri roots. And uh, uh, if Azerbaijan successful secular Azerbaijan managed to pose itself as a model, then uh, a lot of Iranians would look to Azerbaijan uh, as a model. And this would threaten the Iranian uh, uh, model, which is mainly based on theocratic and uh, uh, sectarian uh, factors. So this was uh, number one uh, reason, in my opinion. Now, second, uh, 
I think uh, uh, Iran supporting Armenia is uh, very compatible with the Iranian uh, policies in Central Asia, which for a long period of time uh, were uh, running parallel to the Russian policies, meaning that in order to uh, appease uh, Russia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US, uh, Iran is supporting Armenia. Armenia is an ally of Russia. Then uh, we are working in uh, the same triangle, Iran, uh, Armenia, uh, Russia, which serves uh, Iranian interests in Central Asia, also not only in uh, Southern Caucasus. Uh, uh, third, and very important point, the uh, Azerbaijani-Turkish uh, uh, relations, and uh, for a long period of time also, uh, Iran uh, tried to block Turkey's reach to uh, Central Asia, to Azerbaijan especially. And um, it is uh, well known that the Iranians were very much frustrated from the Turkish support to Azerbaijan and they tried to hinder it in every possible uh, way. Uh, of course, the, 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 after the fall of the Soviet Union, also Turkey had plans to strengthen its relations with the former, former Soviet uh, Union states. And uh, here again, the interest of both Russia and Iran allied and they cooperated to block Turkey's reach to Central Asia and they successfully managed to uh, halt it to a long period of time. But now uh, as the uh, regional configuration has been changing during the last few years and Turkey is strengthening its uh, uh, position in the Middle East, in North Africa and even in Southern uh, Caucasus and Central Asia, establishing the Turkic Council, uh, better and more uh, powerful relations with Azerbaijan, more powerful relations with other Central Asia states. Now, Iran sees uh, Turkey's position as a uh, far more uh, threatening uh, position than before. So this uh, number uh, three factor. Number four is the Azerbaijani-Israeli relations, which uh, Iran always uh, uh, used it as an excuse to uh, legitimatize or to, let's say, promote its uh, Iran-Armenian uh, relations. Although uh, uh, many sees the uh, Azerbaijani-Israeli relations as a reflection or reaction to the Iranian-Armenian uh, alliance at the first place. So these four major factors, I think, plays an important role now. Uh, when this war started, uh, uh, there was uh, internal pressure on the Iranian leadership, uh, and we, we saw many uh, uh, protests uh, uh, demanding the authorities to publicly uh, support Azerbaijan against Armenia. Now, why, while some officials, of course, gave statements that uh, reflect such verbal support, they actively uh, facilitated uh, transfer of Russian weapons and Iranian weapons to the uh, Armenians, and they tried even to hinder, uh, in a way or another, Azerbaijan. But as they came to realize that, Azerbe that Armenia is uh, losing the war and Azerbaijan is uh, winning, they tried to balance their position and uh, they tried even to reach out to Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, but, but everyone knows that uh, Iran uh, uh, lost its bet on Armenia, so it has effectively no other option but to try to mend its uh, offenses with uh, Azerbaijan. Now, an uh, interesting thing, uh, lately, uh, I think uh, 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 Iran executed uh, military drills on the borders of Azerbaijan, and this, was, this is the, the, the first military drills in 30 years on the Azerbaijani border. Uh, the Iranians didn't even make such uh, drills even when, when Armenia was occupying the uh, I will come Azari to that land. question. Uh, <laughs> I will yeah, come this, to was, this is actually a, a message against Az okay. Azerbaijan and uh, Turkey. Uh, so, um, okay, I will stop here so that I don't take also the time. Of no, the, don't worry. Call. You can still continue. We still have a couple of minutes for this. Inshallah, I, I will continue if there is okay, another I will. Okay. I will ask a question. It's a very important point. I need to also mention that one. Uh, Gafarla, I just uh, need to ask you about these the refugees, uh, like for for. 30 years, there are like more than 1 million other refugees being forced to leave the Karabakh area. How, and also, uh, um, like, uh, Turkey's, Turkish government is helping to reconstruct uh, the, the region, the Karabakh region, for these uh, refugees to come back. How do you, what's the recent situation there? Can you give us a little update? Uh, I want to first uh, just add a bit uh, Dr. Baker's point on Iran. 
uh, because I recently read a statement from Iranian foreign ministry uh, spokesperson. He is basically replying what President Aliyev said uh, yesterday about the drills, that Azerbaijan is not welcoming this kind of hostility. And he said today that we will not let any type of Zionist entity in our borders. So I believe it's the first time uh, from Iranian side to openly say that <laughs> Azerbaijan Republic is a Zionist entity. So uh, I think it's, it's, it shows the seriousness of the issue uh, between Tehran and Azerbaijan because uh, President Aliyev also said that I warned them uh, to speak first them friendly and if it doesn't work, we'll speak differently. So I think actually what's going on right now about uh, our uh, Southern neighbors is that they are frustrated that their any attempt to actually include themselves in this type of process uh, is getting out of hand uh, because they couldn't succeed to get a ceasefire uh, in October. They couldn't succeed uh, any type of diplomatic success even though they went to all three capitals. And now maybe uh, we'll see uh, more developments on Iranian side. But on the issue of the question about uh, refugees, we need to understand the point that <clears throat> when we make this official statement of million refugees from uh, the zones occupied, we actually need to mention that important uh, fraction of these refugees are not from Karabakh, they are from Armenia. They are th those who are expelled by the end of the 1980s uh, and sent to Azerbaijan uh, in, in one night even, like we, we, we know that there are some, not some, but particularly four villages next to Kazakh region inside of Armenia, Azerbaijani enclaves that needs to be given back to Azerbaijan as well. And uh, it is not certainly mentioned in the agreement, but I believe if there will be any peace agreement, those should be given back as well. But uh, on the other hand, uh, so if we're speaking about the refugees, we saw that after uh, the ceasefire agreement in the very first day, uh, Ar uh, Russians prepared buses from Armenia to send back those who fled from uh, Khan Kendi and the other parts uh, of Karabakh, the Armenians. So Armenians actually almost I don't think that it's a number that Russians mentioned like 10,000 or 25,000 actually. I don't think it's reality because I don't think that many people came back uh, because most of them either uh, are living right now in Armenia or fled to Russia or other countries. Uh, that's why, uh, but still a certain amount of uh, Armenians came back to Karabakh and now it creates a particular problem that uh, Azerbaijani people needs to come back as well. So what about the population of Khan Kendi, Azerbaijanis who left uh, those parts in 1992. So this is the major first problem about the refugees. We know that they are preparing to go back uh, to Shusha next year, inshallah, because President Ali have mentioned so, and uh, some part of them, obviously, because they are still reconstructing going on in Karabakh. And uh, President also mentioned that there will be return to Zangezur as well, which is uh, Zangezur, for those who doesn't know, is the part in between Azerbaijan and Nakhchivan. So that part is currently now the part of sovereign territory of Armenia, but the uh, president said after Zengezur corridor's opening, we're expecting Azerbaijanis to return to Zengezur as well. So in this case, we will see uh, a kind of, uh, I, I don't want to say confrontation, but a serious kind of diplomatic effort will be needed uh, to maybe uh, result the consultations on returning of the refugees. We see in the agreement that UNHCR will be involved as well. I don't know how, what's the mechanism for this, but still uh, the UN uh, is named in there and UN should be involved. We didn't see any UN peacekeepers there, but yeah. UN kind of administration coming back there. And this is the refugee part, but about the Turkish influence, uh, Turkey's influence is directly, I believe uh, is connected to the personal influence of Recep Tayyip Erdogan as well and a personal friendship in between President Erdogan in Hamaliyev. And this is a very strong tie that we showed in the several uh, occasions that the support between Turkey and Azerbaijan reached its highest, as Professor Kuzio said in the Shusha Declare uh, Agreement. It's the first time Turkey and Azerbaijan signing a collective security pact. So that's how we see that Turkey is becoming a guarantor of not just Nakhchivan. We know that Turkey is guarantor of Nakhchivan since 1922, but now Turkey is also guarantor of Azerbaijan's military security as well. So. In this case, uh, the question of leaving of <laughs> Russian peacekeepers in the next future uh, will directly connect what Ankara thinks as well. So uh, in that sense, Turkey is becoming, uh, I would say, the greatest player in Azerbaijan's foreign policy more than ever in the last 30 years.
Nice. Thank you very much, Kafarla. I have uh, one more question for each participant. Uh, I have like limited time. Ambassador, I just want to ask you that Shusha Declaration lies out a roadmap for the future of the relations between Turkey and Azerbaijan, like from the energy to transportation to the military to the economic humanitarian relations and stuff. Um, we call Azerbaijan and Turkey, they call one nation, two states. Do you think after this declaration, we can call one nation, one state? Uh, thank you once again. Uh, of course, Turkey and Azerbaijan are one nation. Uh, and this famous statement, one nation, two states, uh, is very important. And the process of integration and cooperation has been strengthened by the Shusha Declaration. And Shusha Declaration is a historic uh, document which makes us as close as possible, perhaps the close relationship in the world, one of the causes. Uh, but I would be a little bit careful saying one state because the main purpose of Shusha Declaration, and I think that was stated repeatedly by both President Aliyev and President Erdogan, is to strengthen and protect Azerbaijan's independence as Soviet, as an independent state. I think that's the that's the most important factor here. Uh, in fact, if, uh, I mean, the occupation, the attacks against Azerbaijan were always aimed at undercutting and undermining the independence of uh, and sovereignty of the Republic of Azerbaijan. So we see the Shusha Declaration as the exact opposite thing to the imposed. So in fact, I would speak about the two closest independent sovereign nations, very proud of their brotherhood and fraternity and equally proud of their uh, independence and sovereignty. I think that this this is how we should see, and we should also look at the at the, at the model relationship because we're talking about the, the entire Turkey. Code. We look about we're talking about the greater region and the, the relationship of Turkey and Azerbaijan have an impact on this. So we have to look at how the partnership and friendship and brotherhood between Turkey and Azerbaijan expands into other areas, into different countries, and makes all of us closer to, together. Once again as a fraternity of independent sovereign states. I think that's very important for us to emphasize. Uh, 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 this, uh, this element of the stand, strong current of independence and sovereignty is what makes Azerbaijan what it is. Uh, I, I would consider it's one of the most independent countries in the region, clearly one of the most independent countries in, within the former Soviet Union. Uh, it came from the very beginning. It was there during the Soviet years as well. I mean, we all witnessed that this independent feeling of being uh, different. Uh, being a very staunchly distinct. I think that's very important for all of us. And of course, um, you know, we always, always appreciate what, it, what Turkey has done for us. I, I think Turkish people, the current Turkish leadership, in fact, Turkish leadership throughout the years, I think that's we, we need to appreciate it. And to bring it to a new uh, level. I um, also want to comment on some of the questions you asked earlier about our neighbors about uh, the some statements coming from our neighboring uh, Iran and uh, you know Azerbaijan and as President Ali has pointed out, Azerbaijan has always always worked to build friendly relations with all the. In fact, we're now I mean look we're now offering peace and cooperation to Armenia, and that's a country which occupied yeah. our country for 30 years, has displaced over a million people. And yet, Azerbaijan is actually insisting. It's just a paradoxical situation. Here is a country which violated the law, uh, international law, all the Security Council resolutions. Armenia, which has occupied our lands, it's uh, it's playing innocent now. When the reality is that Azerbaijan is actually offering cooperation to the country to overcome uh, the consequences of the war, the consequences of the conflict. You know, it's very, in a way. What Azerbaijan is doing exactly what happened in Europe uh, post World War II, when uh, responsible minds of Europe decided to build a better community uh, and to overcome the consequences of a terrible war. Azerbaijan is doing it in a regional level, and I, I I don't fully understand the thinking on the Armenian side. I mean, it's not even just just uh, the occupied lands, previously occupied lands were devastated. If you look at Armenia today, if you look at Zangizur. Within Armenia, uh, the parts of Zangizur, which are now part of Armenia, if you look there, they're devastated. There's really nothing there. I mean, we're offering to build relationship, we offer to build economic development for all of us. So, under these circumstances, uh, I, 
I think there was some unfortunate statement coming from uh, our Iranian neighbors because at the end yeah. of the day, uh, the Iran benefits uh, from uh, from the from regional development. In fact, Iran benefits from Azerbaijan's cooperation with Turkey. I think that's 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 good for Iran. Well, it's definitely good for Azerbaijani for ethnics who live in Iran. Uh, and because they're citizens of Iran, we, we want to believe that what is good for the citizens is good for the for the nation of Iran. So that's I think it's an important factor as well. Uh, and uh, and one point uh, which Mr. Kuzio pointed out, I think when we speak about peacekeepers, uh, we need to understand one thing which is very important. And in a sense, there was a, Mr. Kuzio touched on it a little bit. We all need to thrive for a comprehensive peace agreement, which will finalize, finalize the long lasting peace in our region. Once it's done, there is no need uh, for any external peacekeepers. There is no need for anything, uh, which there is no need for hostility. There is no need for, for being resentful for each other. We need to sign a peace agreement, delimit the borders and begin living in the neighborhood of the 21st century. The ball is in an Armenian side. Clearly, Azerbaijan is ready to do that. We insist on this, and we want to see it happen. Uh, that would benefit all of our neighbors. It would benefit, first of all, of course, Armenia and Azerbaijan, but it would also benefit uh, Turkey, Russia, Iran, Georgia, and everybody in the region. Yes. So I think this should be our goal. OK. Thank you very much, Ambassador. My uh, one more question for Mr. Kuzio and Ali Baker. Um, Army, um, Iran was um, like um, doing some um, intense uh, military um, activities in uh, the region and Turkey as well. After 30 years, what is the import? Why today? What is the importance of the time? Why now, Mr. Kuzio? Well, I'll answer that just quickly. We, we've all forgotten one important question related to the IDPs, the, um, the, the huge number of IDPs. And that is, uh, this: the occupied territories are the most mined region in the world. And Armenia has been lying until now, saying that yeah. it has no maps of where these mines are. People cannot really return. Mines kill many civilian people, not military people, um, and including children, old people. Um, and Ar Armenia only began to admit it had maps of these mines when, um, when Azerbaijan agreed to release some prisoners of war. So Armenia needs to give more of these maps so that it can be demined and then people can start returning because people cannot return to an area which is full of mines, they will just be killed. Mr. Kuzi, your, your, your camera is off again, if you can turn it on. Yes. Okay. Um, on, on the question of Iran, I think it's to do, it has to do with the new Iranian leadership. The, this is the most, this is the most radical, um, most um, uh, hardline Iranian new leader that we've had for a long time. That must be a reason for this. Um, also, um, I think it's to do with, uh, as was as already been mentioned, that the the Iran tries to use the, the jump on this anti-Americanism, um, mm -hmm. and and so it it works with Russia and maybe now with the the new Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Also, um, it's a coalition and axis of anti-Americanism. So I think all of this. Um, I think there's also, oh, again, when I compare this to Russia, Ukraine, I kind of see this, this, this Azerbaijani Iranian relationship a bit like Russia, Ukraine, in that Iran does not really treat Azerbaijan as a real country. Um, it kind of looks down on Azerbaijan. This is kind of, a, you know, uh, Russia always says it's about Ukraine, it's an artificial country. These are really Russians living there. And, this, and it's the same way. I think it's a mixture of those, those two things. And then the third thing is that, although it's not true, um, Iran will always be scared of this potential Azerbaijani minority in Iran. Yes. Okay. Uh, and even though there 
Azerbaijan has nobody in Azerbaijan lays territorial claim to Iran, but Iran, you know, they live in a conspiracy mindset. And so they, they, they see this. Um, on this question of borders, just one final quick point. Armenia always votes with Russia in the United Nations in support of the annexation of Crimea. Always. Um, they, 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 in their mindset, Armenia, compare Crimea to Karabakh. They say if Crimea mm -hmm. has a right to so-called self-determination, Karabakh does. Armenia needs to stop voting with Russia, then we can take them seriously. But I agree with the ambassador that the peace treaty is imperative, but the peace treaty has to be based on the old Soviet internal boundaries between republics now becoming mm -hmm. international borders. This is what happened everywhere else in the Soviet, former yes. Soviet Union. It could not, did not happen in, in Azerbaijan, Armenia because of the war, the first war, but mm -hmm. the former boundary between, Soviet boundary between Armenia and Azerbaijan has to become the new international border. Um, and, I, mm -hmm. and, I, and, and when that is accepted in Yerevan, there will be a peace treaty. And then I think the situation will improve completely, but, um, okay. But I'm a bit, a bit okay. cautious of that will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Taras Kuzio. Uh, Ali Baker, I'm coming to you because this is the important question I need to ask separately. Uh, why Iran is doing military exercise in the, the border of Turkey and Azerbaijan? And also, I'm not sure if you read uh, the news about the, the Zulfikar trial. Um, Iran has this Zulfikar missile, which uh, threatens the region. Um, do you think um, um, Israel can uh, also help Turkey and Azerbaijan in this case uh, to with the um, Iron Dome to uh, cut this uh, Zulfikar missile? I don't know if you understand the question. I mean, I, I, I ask in a very hard way. Uh, it's okay. Uh, regarding the first part, why, why Iran is doing it right now, I think that uh, of course, I, I really appreciate what uh, Mr. Ambassador has said uh, on the Iranian issue, but we know that he has his diplomatic uh, limitations. So as an academician, we can speak freely on that. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Iran is uh, looking down at Azerbaijan. Also, Iran is considering Turkey as a rival. So. Um, for a long period of time, as we mentioned, they, they uh, effectively blocked Turkey's reach to uh, Caucasus and uh, Central Asia. Now that uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan are working to uh, open a line that connects also uh, Nachifan to um, Baku, this means that Turkey can surpass Iran and reach Central Asian countries without the need of Iran. And this is very important point because it means that they can totally neglect uh, the Iranian efforts to block them and they can effectively reach to whatever they want politically, economically, and even militarily. Now that we have the Afghani situation or the Afghan situation, mm -hmm. the recent developments and Taliban uh, uh, overtook the power there, uh, Turkey is also uh, effectively present in that uh, uh, country and uh, Iran is considering also Afghanistan its backyard. So uh, Iran is seeing Turkey's influence increasing, and the uh, uh, most effective way to hit it is to try to again cut the connection between Azerbaijan and Turkey. But I think this is a hard reach for the Iranians. So they are trying to do this by linking uh, uh, Azerbaijan to Israel because this will, uh, in their mind, will undermine. Uh, the legitimacy of any Turkish Azari uh, relation and also uh, uh, Azerbaijani relations with Israel in the eyes of the Middle Eastern uh, uh, people because they see also Israel as an occupation, uh, occupational power. So Iran is trying to link always Azerbaijan to Israel in order to legitimize its role. Now, regarding your second part of the question, I don't think that Israel needs Azerbaijan to to uh, hit Israel, to hit Iran. I mean, they have been hitting Iran in the last few years inside Tehran and inside very critical facilities, uh, nuclear facilities, uh, economic facilities, and 
uh, Israel is really present through intelligence, human intelligence and uh, technological also means inside Iran. So they don't need any country as a platform as a, or as a launch. launch. The reason, yeah. Ali Beka, I'm sorry, disturbed, the reason I'm asking that the, the Zulfikar missile only be recognized uh, by the Iron Dome. Uh, none of the like missile or any any dome can, cannot re, uh, recognize the Zulfikar missile. So, do you think um, um, mm -hmm. Turkey is not? Yeah, go on. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I, I, I understand your question, but let me tell you that the Iron Dome is, as far as I know, specialized to block short-range missile uh, missiles. That's and right. Missiles that yeah. And, and Zulfikar is not a, a, a small or short-range missile, so uh, I'm not seeing why they would use the Iron Dome to, to block it. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, yes, the Iranian missiles are, I mean, Iran is the, uh, uh, has uh, a plenty of uh, different uh, missiles. It's number one missile country in the region, so it's, yes, constitutes a threat to many regional countries. A, a country like Turkey that doesn't have an effective long-range air defense missile system is also threatened. And this is one reason why Turkey is trying to develop its own uh, long-range uh, air defense systems to block such efforts from whoever to try to threaten Turkey. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baker. Um, Baker, lastly, you. Uh, what, what, how do you see the, um, the relations uh, with Turkey? Turkey has an important, very important role on Azerbaijan. Um, do you think in the future, I, I ask the same question to Ambassador, can we say one nation, one state from now on? Uh, I think I think that the things now in geopolitical sense, when you think about wider uh, ideals of both Turkey and Azerbaijan, it's going not one state, like one nation, one state, but one nation, six states. Because the thing is, there's one question actually I really liked very much in uh, in the questions section here, which is connected to what you asked as well and what I'm answering. Uh, it's asking like to me to what extent the resolution of Nagorno-Karabakh and Taliban taking over Afghanistan will have impact to politics of Turkmenistan. In the very first reading, I, I also thought like what the kind of person asking actually, but now I will try to elaborate in one pot everything. The Turkic Council, Dr. Baker also mentioned, that is increasing its potential as well right now. The thing is, uh, the Azer Azerbaijan was the only member who had actually uh, a frozen conflict which could have turned to hot conflict in any time, and it happened. So now Azerbaijan's problem is mostly solved, and now we see that Turkmenistan is going to be a member of the Council next month. So in this sense, the Afghanistan part of the question that the person asked me is actually related to this uh, Turkmenistan's uh, membership as well. Because if we think of Turkic world as in under the umbrella of the Turkic Council as an organization, uh, the missing part that, for example, like last week they discussed Afghanistan, and the missing part was Turkmenistan because the Turkmenistan is a major country who has the border to the uh, Afghanistan's uh, developments there. So. This actually can make Turkic world more integrated. The solution in Nagorno-Karabakh can show actually uh, the help, the standing of uh, and supporting each other between Turkey and Azerbaijan can actually make some difference. And you know, like in the beginning of 1990s, there was like kind of uh, expectation from Turkey to become a huge bridge between the West and uh, the Turkic countries. Uh, and maybe in a sense of uh, Azerbaijan's oil potential, Turkey actually achieved that. But in a Central Asia sense, it was more on cultural and educational uh, kind of partnerships. But now uh, we see that those partnerships are turning to political partnerships. So it's very important to see the achievements uh, between Turkey and Azerbaijan, especially in Karabakh sense, uh, to turn actually something fruitful. And which I think the Russia fears most, because uh, we especially saw uh, the speak ups, not just by Zhirinovsky in Russia, by other kind of officials as well uh, to mm -hmm. to kind of sound uh, very kind of uh, Zhirinovsky like in the past months and saying like Turkey have greater ambitions over, over Caspian Sea they are actually planning more after Karabakh and uh, they're actually 
and I don't see Russian interest is directly overpassing the interest of our nations, but still, uh, they are actually claiming that uh, very openly right now. But uh, this thing needs to be taken seriously because these things uh, are uh, spoke can be spoken by the some politicians that are not very uh, kind of sensible in a sense of politics in Russia, but they still uh, can reflect a very ideal of the Russian ru ruling elite. So uh, it's it's not very secret that they are actually uh, getting uh, kind of triggered when they hear uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan reaching out Central Asia, actually deciding that maybe even the yesterday's uh, kind of uh, meeting over Afghanistan could have triggered something else in Russia as well. So the very important thing is to think about what will happen, uh, who will actually have this uh, mandate over the uh, regions that we're talking about. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Kaparda. It was really a good conversation. Thank you for all of you uh, for uh, for joining us. Uh, Ambassador Eden Suleymanov, thank you very much for your opinion. Professor Taras Kuzio, thank you very much for your participation and opinion as well. Mr. Ali Baker, it was interesting to have you and thank you very much uh, for your time. And Turan Gaparda, thank you very much to you too. Uh, and I would like to thanks to Circle Foundation for our organizing such event um, and I'll hope to see you all in uh, in in the future uh, thank, uh, you. thank you very so, much thank you very much for the invitation thank you thank you